Great. Well, thank you all so much for joining us for today's program. Uh, let's see if I can pronounce all these words. Uh, Beauport, a dream realized. Beauport is a, the evocative name for a wondrous confection of a house dreamed of and brought to reality by Henry Davis Sleeper. He was one of America's first interior designers. He was Massachusetts born and he was mostly self-taught. A close friend of Isabella Stewart Gardner, who Mary um, told us about a few months ago, uh, he shared her passion for collecting and creating beautiful living spaces. Beauport was begun in 1907 and would probably still be in a state of redesign and renovation, except for his death in 1934. This magnificent seaside cottage has been in the care of historic New England since 1937, and in this illustrated talk, we will uncover some of its mysteries and treasures. And this talk is led by art historian Mary Woodward, who serves as a guide at several historic New England properties. She previously served as public programs coordinator and educator at the Concord Museum. Mary has a BA in art history from Furman University and an MA in art history from Emory University. She has more than 40 years of experience in museums of all shapes and sizes, from the comprehensive collection at the Cleveland Museum of Art to the one room log cabin birthplace of President James K. Polk. So all 100 of us, let's give a big <laughs> virtual round of applause to Mary for joining us here this morning. And Mary, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Oh, thank you, Robert. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody who's watching uh, today. The Friends of Tewksbury Library, thank you for your support. And um, the Friends at Raleigh Library over there watching with us as well. So thank you, everybody, for being with us. As Robert says, um, the talk is called Beauport, A Dream Realized. Uh, it's hard to categorize this house into any one style. It was built on Eastern Point near Gloucester, Massachusetts, and it began as a somewhat modest seaside cottage, the way that those houses in Newport, Rhode Island are sometimes called cottages. It began as a 26 room house for Sleeper and his mother, for Henry Sleeper and his mother. It didn't stay that size or shape for long and it grew to what you'll see today, over 40 rooms to display his collections, entertain his guests and provide a comfortable summer home for his family. Sleeper was enamored of America's colonial past as well as Asian art and English medieval art. And they will all find a home in his home at Beauport. Henry Davis Sleeper, you see him here in an early portrait. He was known as Harry to his friends. He was born into a wealthy Boston family in 1878. He was the youngest of three sons born to a retired Civil War major and his wife. The family money came from real estate businesses and that provided an income for Sleeper so that he could collect art and build his dream home. We, some of you were first introduced to Henry Sleeper when we had our talk about Isabella Stewart Gardner and the creation of her house museum, which was originally called Fenway Court, you probably remember that, and is now the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. Upon her death in 1924, she named Sleeper the trustee for her museum. So we're going to touch on their relationship later in our talk today as well. As a child, Henry Sleeper was tutored at home, apparently due to his poor health. There's no evidence of an actual earned degree at any college or university. He began collecting antiques at an early age and he traveled with his mother on many antiquing trips, possibly even to Europe, we're not sure. He was most likely a very precocious child. Uh, there is a story about Henry making take uh, at age 11, remaking the family's pool table into a, a small Japanese garden site. So imagine that. <laughs> uh, here's a photo of his bedroom at the family home in Boston on Beacon Hill. Uh, the sleeper home, one author has written, became a virtual warehouse of furniture and prints and decorative objects that would eventually find places at Beauport. Um, so clearly, from an early age, 
Henry Sleeper had a habit of admiring and collecting beautiful things. So he started young and he kept going. So let's have a look at where he chose to build that beautiful Beauport house. We'll do a little history with this map. So in 1606, the French explorer and colonist Samuel de Champlain sailed into a harbor, which you see on the sort of lower left corner of your map there, um, sailed into this harbor, which would eventually be called Gloucester Harbor, and he declared it Le Beau Port. English settlers followed, and in 1642, they named the place Gloucester, and they made it a town. But strangely enough, that early town of Gloucester was not a fishing port. They were farmers and they were loggers and the town center was nearly two miles inland. So more or less right smack in the middle of that map was the town. But by the 18th century, the town was awash in fishermen who were making a rich, a living from the rich fishing grounds of the Grand Banks. So an area to the east of town, and it's the peninsula at the bottom of the map that comes out looking like a kind of amoeba shape at the bottom. That peninsula formed one side of the harbor and it was known as Eastern Point. It was rough farmland, but it was sold to developers in the 1880s. Wealthy Bostonians began changing that farmland into a neighborhood of private home lots. It's an easy commute, even in those days, really, from Boston up to Gloucester. In 1904, a large, there it is, 300-room hotel called the Colonial Arms opened on Eastern Point to accommodate those visitors who maybe didn't have the funds or the wherewithal to build their own summer cottage there. Henry Sleeper first visited the area in 1906. He was invited out by his friend, Abram Pyatt Andrew, to see the house that Andrew had built for himself called Red Roof. And even though uh, this photo has been colorized and it's, it, it's misleading, the house actually called Red Roof is the one on the right, okay? The area was becoming a fashionable spot for summer homes. His friend Andrew was a well-respected Harvard economist and later elected to the U.S. House of Representatives from Massachusetts. Nevertheless, his home at Red Roof was home to some bacchanalian soirees with his friends. There was a not-so-secret hidden bar in the library during the years of prohibition from 20 to 33. And here's a photo probably taken by Andrew at one of those parties because he's often not in the picture, but we assume he was the one taking the picture. Here's a photo from one of the parties. I've labeled um, Henry Sleeper there on the left and standing next to him, almost always trying to cover her face a bit is Isabella Stewart Gardner. It's clear that the visit to Red Roof was transformational for Sleeper. Just over a year later, Henry Sleeper bought lot number 101, only a few yards away from the Colonial Arms Hotel. Now, that would be just to the left of this, uh, out of view of this photo on the left. And Henry Sleeper began designing his family's new summer home. He hired a young Gloucester architect named Havdan Hansen, who seems to not have gone to architecture school per se, but had completed correspondence courses from Philadelphia. Together, Historic New England says, they created a house of risk and ambition. The house was ready for guests the following year, and A. Pyatt Andrew, his neighbor, was Henry Sleeper's first guest. Sleeper chose the name Beauport from Champlain's direct, uh, description of the harbor as Le Beauport. Sleeper actually named it the way I have designated it here. He named it Little Beauport to begin with, but the house quickly outgrew that name. Additions began within a year of his building it. In a fortuitous calamity, if there's such a thing, at least for Sleeper, on New Year's Day in 1908, while Little Beauport was under construction, 
the giant colonial arms hotel next door burned to the ground, um, apparently with no loss of life, happy to report. Out of this development, though, Sleeper was able to buy some of the land adjacent to his small lot and begin with plans to expand his house in that direction. It was a family home, a summer home from the start, with Sleeper's mother living there with him. His middle brother and his wife bought a cottage called Black Bess, six doors away from Beauport. So the whole thing became a family affair there on Eastern Point for the Sleepers. So what did Sleeper build there? Historic New England is the preservation organization that I work for and that owns and maintains Beauport. And here's how they begin the description. It's sort of wordy. So I put up a kind of uh, complicated photo to go with these words. It's a flowing mixture of styles from Norman through Gothic to Tudor and Chinese. Roofs and siding of English Queen Anne revival and American shingle styles of the 1880s and 90s. Bay windows, round towers, a manorial chimney, carved wooden figures, corbels, a palatial dovecote, spiral belfry, peaked roofs, and Palladian windows, <laughs> all in one house. Sleeper was inspired by literary associations, by historical styles, by favorite color combinations to create a personal statement. I call it his manifesto. And yet we should be cautioned not to take it all too seriously. It was a summer home. It was a party house. It was a place for him to freely indulge his decorating passions. He was his own client. It's not everyone's cup of tea. One author remarked that the house, and I quote, does not exhibit any architectural cohesion. Another one called it, and I quote, a veritable labyrinth. Well, I think Sleeper wouldn't mind those comments at all. Um, I'm going to go ahead and show you the floor plan here, and let's not worry about the colors yet, but let's just look at the floor plan. Sleeper wrote to a friend in a rare surviving letter and he said, mightn't it be fun to have a house in which each room could recapture some of the spirit of a specific mood or phase or period of our American life from the time of Plymouth down through the revolution and the early Republic? This was when the house was first finished in 1908. Yes, and you see it shaded in green there. It consisted of 26 rooms, two stories, but the spaces were not grand in scale. In fact, the whole house, the whole house feels uh, personal, kind of cloistered, intimate spaces. Uh, the largest areas are devoted to dining. So let's have a look at some of the first places that he created. Um, I've tried to make a color-coded uh, floor plan to kind of follow the history or the chronology of the house, uh, the house's growth. So as you can see, expanding in, in nearly every direction. So among the rooms that the house began with, shaded in green, was this one, the medieval hall. It was a main feature of the house, and it's a hall, like you would imagine, existed in an English castle of the Middle Ages. It had wood paneling uh, covering the walls. It had exposed wooden beams on the ceilings, a brick floor, an enormous fireplace there. There was a huge tapestry that hung above the wall, a uh, fireplace on the wall, and the room was filled with turned and carved wooden furniture, either dating from hundreds of years ago actual medieval time period or made to look as if it did. Now, near to the medieval hall adjacent to it, Sleeper created something he called the green dining room, featuring wood paneling that he salvaged from an earlier 18th century house located elsewhere. At this time, that he was doing this in 1908, just about everybody thought that colonial homes the original ones built in the 1700s, 1600s, um, both inside and outside should be painted white because they assumed that that's the way they had been painted originally. 
Sleeper took a different approach. He scraped away layers of actual paint that, and he found a wide range of paint colors on some of the salvaged wood, including greens and browns and reds and blues. So he used the salvaged wood, but he painted it green. So modern technical analysis and history would prove him right. Not everything back in colonial times was painted white. Um, there were some strident colors, in fact, as researchers and conservators discovered, you may remember in the 1980s, look what they discovered at George Washington's Mount Vernon. Uh, and their discoveries continue today. Here are photos of the new room and the dining room at Mount Vernon in colors that George Washington himself chose. So now that you've seen those images, Sleeper's choice of green might seem a little tame. So let's look at the plan again and see what happened next. Just a few years after the first phase of building uh, in 1911, the front of the house, the yellow section down in the lower left, the front of the house, he added a room and a two-story stone tower adjacent to it. And here's what it looks like on the exterior. There's the stone tower and the interior. It's referred to as being in the Norman style, reminiscent of stone towers uh, during Norman England. And uh, Sleeper made it a book tower. He made it a, a library for one. It's a charming, special space in which to read. It's not at all a very large space. It's tall and it's narrow. It's got two layers to it, two levels, and it's kind of like a scholar's cell or um, the carol that you had in the study carol you might have had in the library when you were younger. Um, a staircase to access the second floor is actually tucked outside the room in the hallway, and so it doesn't interrupt this beautiful round shape of the room. Henry Sleeper owned uh, a collection of pieces of, uh, made by colonial silversmith and patriot Paul Revere. And he eventually donated those pieces to the Museum of Fine Arts in 1925. But before he did that, he kept them in a room that he called the Paul Revere Room. And that room, even though it doesn't have the silver in it anymore, still has references, a very bold reference to Paul Revere in its wallpaper. So during the restoration of Paul Revere's actual old house in Boston, some of you may have visited, fragments of a wallpaper from the 1700s was discovered. And it was a familiar motif called pillar and arch. And you see that sort of represented to the left there. The paper, once it was discovered, was reproduced by the Paul Revere Memorial Association uh, as a money-making project with the addition, as you can see, of a church steeple in the design. The wallpaper then reinforces the connection to Paul Revere and the most famous story about Paul Revere, right? So this type of inspiration we see influencing Sleeper again and again. It's a connection to history, to literature, and to material and color that's important. So you see that he used this reproduced um, Paul Revere Association wallpaper in my photo on the right there. And I want you to look behind on the wall and look at the scale of the wallpaper. It's enormous, the pillar arch and church steeple wallpaper. Uh, and it's a very small room. So he's playing with that kind of fun design there as well. So up a secret winding staircase, not so secret, behind a hidden door, you'll find the belfry chamber. Now chamber, of course, means bedroom. This is a celadon colored vision of a guest room, isn't it? The wallpaper, let me show you another view. There you go, two images. The wallpaper was produced by a French company and it was a reference to a much older uh, 18th century wallpaper. It was block printed in over 20 colors. Sleeper had the paper cut to fit all the angles of the room ceiling and walls. He also cut out um, flowers and birds and plants and pasted them into areas where the wallpaper wouldn't quite reach or the design wouldn't reach. Uh, one uh, sort of curmudgeonly 
author described it as a polyhedral nightmare, uh, but I suppose maybe he was reminded of some horrible wallpapering project of his own, perhaps. I personally think it's absolutely an enchanting space to be in. So let's see that the year 1917 uh, really turned out to be a very big year for the house. It's shaded, I've shaded it in brown. It's sort of on the lower right-hand side of your map. Sleeper created the Pembroke room. You can see it's the very large space there, the largest room in the house. He tracked down and salvaged paneling from his mother's ancestral home in Pembroke, Massachusetts, which had been built in about 1650. His mother actually died in this year, 1917, and it's been suggested that her passing away had prompted him to create this room to commemorate her in a special way. It was Sleeper's favorite room, and it was easily the most copied room in, by his clients, uh, and one he was asked to do over and over again in other people's homes, and we'll explore a little more of that in a minute. But the Pine, the Pembroke room also goes by the name of Pine Kitchen. It was a spacious place for dining and the display of his large, over 250 piece collection of red ware ceramics. So it was an early American kitchen was what it looked like. And of course, Sleeper chose to have early American food served there in his early American style dining room and kitchen. This large room was a terrific place to entertain guests. So let's talk for a minute about the people who were sleepers, close friends, and constant guests at Boatport. And for that, we're going to have to take a trip to the mystical Bohemian land of Dabsville. Some of the residents of Dabsville are pictured here. There's Henry Sleeper in the far right. Sleeper was the last official member to join the select group who had homes on Eastern Point. So Dabsville is an acronym they made from their initials. D, and they're not all pictured, but I want to run them down for you. D was Joanna Davidge. She was the mistress of a private school in New York City called Miss Davidge's Classes. Uh, she built a home on the far side of Red Roof. A was for his friend A. Pyatt Andrew, the Harvard economist, and you see him in the back row on the left in the bow tie. B was for the society painter Cecilia Bow, and unfortunately she is not in this photo, but she was an extremely famous popular portrait art painter. S was for Sleeper, but also for the lady in black sitting next to him, Miss Carolyn Sinkler. She was a South Carolina society belle who built her home right between Andrew Pye, uh, and Sleeper's home. And she called it Wrong Roof. I think I put in a picture. Yeah. So there's Beauport, there's Red Roof, there's Wrong Roof. And that was Carolyn Sinkler. Somewhat of a very sad story. She'd been engaged as a young woman, but her fiance died just before the wedding. And she adopted mourning clothes the rest of her life. She either wore black or lavender. She was known in the social circles as a lavender lady. Uh, so it was an eclectic and eccentric group, to say the least. And in this photo, they're joined by a couple of guests. They're joined by um, a man named Okakuro Kakuzo, who was the uh, curator of Asian art at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. He was a close associate of Isabella Stewart Gardner, and that is her in the background there sitting in white, Isabella Stewart Gardner. Some people were referred to the area along the coastline, as well as being called Dabsville, as the Seashore because the only two male members of Dabsville, the real official members were Sleeper and Andrew. Um, Isabella Stewart Gardner was an honorary member of Dabsville who was the exception to the rule. She had no house on Eastern Point, but then again, she was Isabella Stewart Gardner. She, in her letters to her friends, didn't call it Dabsville. She called the place Fog Land, Fog Land. During World War I, oops, let's go on. 
Um, Sleeper, and this is not Sleeper, this is Andrew, but Sleeper held a very important position in an aid organization developed by his friend that you see here, A. Pyatt Andrew, the American Field Service in France. American volunteers drove ambulances carrying wounded soldiers away from the front lines during the war to hospitals. Sleeper was the chief fundraiser for the organization in the United States, and then he became the director of its, organ of its headquarters in Paris in 1918. He and his friend Andrew were honored and decorated by the French for their service. Their 2,500 volunteers at the American Field Service transported more than 400,000 wounded troops during the war. So we've made it now to 1921, and um, I tried to shade it with the sort of reddish orange color at the top. You can see that he added a room called the Octagon. We can see why on the plan there. Um, and here's a picture of it. It's also referred to as the Souvenir de France room. It's filled with examples of French toll work, and that's painted tin that's made into decorative objects like trays, lampshades, candlesticks, and the like. And in this case, he chose to collect red toll wear. The walls were originally painted a deep eggplant purple color, and this would have certainly made for a vibrant combination with the red toll pieces. Now the walls have faded to a sort of darkish charcoal gray and it's still a very dramatic room. It features over the fireplace a portrait of the Marquis de Lafayette, of course wearing a red jacket, of course, it goes with the room, doesn't it? And it's meant to remind the viewer, us, his guests, of the confraternity between France and the young colony at the time of the American Revolution, young colonies. Of course, the name octagon refers to the fact that there are eight sides in the room, but there were other ways that Sleeper included eight. There are eight lamps in the room, there are eight rugs in the room, and there was a table in the middle with eight sides on it. These are elements that Sleeper would have hoped would have entertained and interested his guests, and I'm sure that it did. So also creative when he created the octagon was a new dining room called the Golden Step Room. Originally, it was a covered porch. You can see its brick floor there, but he turned it into a spacious dining room and enclosed it with this magnificent diamond paned window over there on the left that hides a secret. It opens by lowering it into the wall and outside you see a beautiful view of uh, the harbor. The room, Golden Step Room, takes its name from the model of a ship, the Golden Step. It was a Chinese trade ship, and it's, the model is here displayed on the top of a table, which is rather ornate because it's a, it's a, ja, a Chinese funeral table, a Chinese pall. Again, this shows how the creation of and design of an entire room was sponsored uh, and inspired by one piece, and it's typical of Sleeper's design methods. Upstairs, above these two rooms on the second floor, another important room took place. It also has far reaching views there. You see it there uh, in the red up there. There's one called Indian Room and there's one called Mariner's Room. They have far reaching views of the harbor and the aptly named Mariner's Room is a large wood paneled space filled with items related to the lives of mariners and sea captains. Of course, Gloucester became a huge shipping and fishing port, so it's a natural inspiration for sleepers designs. A ship journal, like this one that you've pictured here on the right, sits open on the desk in sleepers mariner's room, documenting whaling trips of the 1830s and 40s. It's stamped like this one is with images of whales, and you can see on the upper left corner of the journal there a long black smudge, which is actually the shape of a whale, which represents a catch. The New England, uh, Historic New England Guidebook goes on to say this, quote, the creation of the Mariner's Room coincides with the discovery during the 1920s of Herman Melville as a major American writer. 
So Sleeper here, again, I think is making one of his uh, literary illusions when he included this journal in the room open for his guests to read or a journal like this one. So Sleeper made another big change on the first floor at this time. The English Medieval Hall of 1907 becomes in 1923, the China Trade Room. It was uh, transformed due the, to the lucky acquisition of some very special wallpaper. In 1923, the room was made over as the China Trade Room when Sleeper had the walls covered with 40 strips of 12 foot high panoramic wallpaper. And I'll show you a sample here. Here we go. You can see more closely in color on the right. The original 18th century Chinese wall hand painted wallpaper had been ordered by Philadelphia banker and signer of the Declaration of Independence, Robert Morris, who had it imported in 1784. But guess what? He never used it. He never took um, ownership of it. Uh, the unused wallpaper rolls were found still in their original shipping crates, I believe in Marblehead, Massachusetts. Um, so when Sleeper, yeah, found in a Marblehead attic. So Sleeper got his hands on them and put them all over the walls of his um, former medieval hall. The painted scenes depict the manufacture of porcelain and the cultivation of rice and tea. So at this point in the home's development, the home is just over 20 years old and it's been in a near constant state of change. Some authors have suggested that it was if the house had grown from the inside outwards, and it really does seem to start with the central core and move in almost every direction. So let's have a look to see what that does to your roof lines. It was the architect Hansen's job to try and keep up, adding steps inside the house where he needed to and different gables and dormers to the roof, just to try to adjust to the changing room levels and shapes. So returning from his duties in France, Sleeper set up an office in Boston to work on interior design projects for clients. He was one of the very first professional interior designers in the United States, and he became a very successful one with commissions from coast to coast. He had friends like Isabella Stewart Gardner have hire him, Hollywood actors, nobody super famous that I think any of us would uh, know, but I, I've, I've, I've misplaced some of the names of the Hollywood actors. But anyway, he had commissions from coast to coast um, and also among the super, super wealthy. And um, most notably, that would be Henry Francis DuPont, for whom he worked on two houses, Winterthur in uh, Delaware, which we'll discuss, and um, one what I won't talk much about, but a home, um, I'll mention it because you might want to know, uh, Chestertown, located uh, on uh, Long Island in Southampton. But it's his work here at Winterthur that really is uh, the most um, influential. Sleeper's, um, really, his most influential contribution to the practice of interior design after the creation of Beauport, of course, would be the five years that he assisted and advised DuPont in his creation of Winterthur, which is also now a museum. You may know that. With limitless money, DuPont remodeled the family home that he had there in Delaware into a museum of more than 175 rooms filled with more than 90,000 decorative objects covering American styles from colonial America to the Civil War, and including a room like Henry Sleeper's Pembroke room or pine kitchen. Um, and you can see an example of Winterthur's pine kitchen on the right. It doesn't look like that anymore, I understand, but that's an old view of probably what Sleeper had uh, worked out at Winterthur. The two men fell out over what else? Money. But Sleeper's contribution is undeniable. And Winterthur, in turn, influenced much of what was designed and decorated from the mid 20th century onwards, as it continues to inspire and educate. Winterthur offers tours and research facilities, but it also has two graduate degree programs in American decorative arts. So um, that's another way to look at Sleeper's reputation and his influence continuing on into this century. 
Sleeper made an influential trip to other historic sites in the area, including um, Virginia, he went to Williamsburg, and he went to Monticello. And these things all really helped focus his attention on the history of this country. Ever since the Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia in 1876, uh, which obviously celebrated 100 years of the signing of the Declaration of Independence, there had been a growing interest in the art and culture of the United States. Previously, everything European had reigned in dominance over American things, but that was starting to change, and it did change greatly beginning in, 17, in 1876. So that by the time Sleeper comes along in the start of the 20th century, this interest is called colonial revivalism. And you can see it in architecture and fine arts, decorative arts, garden design, town planning. Our organization, the one that I work for and the one that owns and maintains Beauport, Historic New England, was founded in that same mode in vain in 1910, where the oldest and largest regional heritage organization in the nation. And a year later, in 1911, our first director of museums for Historic New England, and we were called Spinea, so Society for Protection of New England Antiquity, uh, Preservation of New England and Antiquities. But in 1911, the first year after our creation, our first director of museums was Henry Sleeper. By the 1930s, Sleeper and his dream home of um, Beauport were well known in designing and decorating circles. Uh, it, it was featured in a lot of home magazines and articles and Beauport became a way for him to publicize his professional business in order to attract more clients. His main contribution to colonial revivalism, again, must have been his creation of his own pine kitchen or pine book room of 1917. He created what one author called, and I quote, an artful and wildly imitated early presentation of this ideal. It's an enormous space. It's sort of misleading because original colonial kitchens certainly could not have been as large as that. And it's chocked full of all these kind of cooking appliances that you see here, so much so that another architectural historian who uh, also worked for Historic New England called this an example of, and I quote, a culinary obstacle course, which I just love. Uh, here, is its manifestation at the house that I work at, the Winslow Crocker House, uh, originally built in 1780, but restored and, um, and actually moved and restored in the 1930s. And there is our version of the Pine Kitchen. In May of 1934, Sleeper was inducted as an honorary member of the American Institute of Architects for, and I quote, his outstanding contribution to the advancement of architecture and applied arts as a collector of Americana and protector of the culture of early America. Well, on the inside of that giant house, who was helping Sleeper run this house? He had a housekeeper named Mary Watson. There she is in the middle apparently displaying the turkey. Uh, she began working for him in 1919 and she remained with the house even past his death. Um, this was completely understandable. Apparently she drew up diagrams for herself of where everything was placed in the house so that uh, when she took things off shelves to remove them or clean around them dust, she could put them back in the right spot. George, Mary's husband, George, was the caretaker over at Red Roof. Andrew's house two doors over. George and Mary had a home of their own in Gloucester, but from early spring through Thanksgiving every year they lived in a five-room suite above the kitchen at Beauport. Now let's turn our attention to the exterior for just a minute. The landscape around Beauport did not escape sleepers' attention to detail, and happily today parts of it look very much like it did in his lifetime. Uh, and you can see this from a, a before photo and a current photo. There were subtle differences, though, uh, that that, Bo, that Sleeper planned for the landscape. And a, a far away from the house, at the far edges of the house, uh, he planned for the landscape to be a little bit more naturalistic, the edge of it a little bit more wild and curving, and um, it becomes 
the plantings become more formal as they approach the house. Uh, their native species on the outside, uh, the exterior edges turn to more formal specimen plants and flower beds as you get close to the house. Sleeper became ill during a trip to California. He returned home and he died of cancer at the age of 56 in 1934. He's buried in Cambridge, Massachusetts, Mount Olive Cemetery, next to his parents. At the time of his death, he had one author said, literally run out of land upon which to build. Let me show you an aerial view of the house. Um, over to the far left, you see a roof going the wrong way and an arch down by the water. That's a separate house. And in the little tiny shadow you see, uh, that's how much room there is between Sleeper's house and the house that got built where the hotel used to be. His brother inherited Beauport from him, but he had to sell it to cover Sleeper's debts. Historic New England was interested in acquiring the house at the time, but before they acted on it, Mr. and Mrs. Charles McCann she, being the eldest daughter of F.W. Woolworth, bought the house and its contents. They had been in the house before. They knew what they were getting into, and they wanted to buy the house. They fully intended to give the house to historic New England, but they both passed away before they were able to put the plan on into action. Their three grown children, however, honored their parents' wishes and donated the house and its contents to historic New England in 1942. So it is officially officially known as the Sleeper McCann House in order to honor the loving owners of the house. And in doing so, the house continues to welcome guests just as Henry Sleeper intended. So in closing, I'd like to quote a famous and familiar to you, I'm sure Robert A. M. Stern, the architect who wrote this about Henry Sleeper's Beauport. He said, Beauport is no ordinary antiquarian assemblage. To proceed through the maze-like configuration of its rooms is to walk through Sleeper's mind. At Beauport, eccentricity is elevated to the level of genius. And with that, I'll end. Thank you very much. You can take some questions and comments. So Mary, a uh, wonderful job as expected. Uh, let's take about 10 to 15 minutes of uh, questions and comments. Uh, let me see here. Karen says, great summary of this amazing house and its creator, thank you. Uh, thank Renee, you. Jamie and Chai uh, during your presentation commented on some of the uh, architecture. Uh, so let me jump to the questions here. Diane says, can you tell me something about the workmen who built both Beauport, uh, were they local or were they brought over from Europe? Um, they were most likely locals. I don't believe Henry Sleeper certainly brought over, but as you saw when we looked at Isabella Stewart Gardner building her home, um, in just a just really less, she began just a decade or so before, and well. About the same time, more or less, uh, she was able to use European artisans. Um, now she probably brought them over. So I would say that um, he probably had the ability to have European, uh, say, Italian masons doing some of his work and things like that. Um, it's quite possible that he shared some of the kinds of um, European workers that had been building big homes and notably Isabella Stewart Gardner's. But I, I don't think he, um, I'm not aware that he on purpose built, uh, brought over people. I will say this, uh, part, of, part of why we don't know a lot about the actual building of uh, Sleeper's Beauport is that his professional and personal papers uh, didn't survive him. Um, we don't we don't have them as records to look at. And so uh, we are left in the dark about those uh, kinds of questions. Uh, Donna asks, what was the term you used to describe the chimney? Oh, um, let's see. I think I said manorial um, and that it's uh, like a giant, um, like a manor house. Yeah. So uh, just large, um, very prominent and uh, usually decorated on the outside. So manor, manorial, like a big English manor. 
And Donna also asks, was the brick in a circular pattern a design choice? Always, <laughs> always, every every attention. I mean, we can't underestimate that everything that we see at Beauport was a design choice by Sleeper. Yeah. Uh, Kathy asks, do you happen to know the French wallpaper company name? I do. Um, that made the, uh, the the beautiful green flowered room is uh, Zuber, Z-U-B-E-R. And um, they produced this paper in 1832, but it was based on um, a Chinese hand painted paper from the previous century. So that is the one in the green belfry chamber, the flowery room, Zuber. They're still in business. Uh, Kathy, I'm going to circle back to your other question towards the end. Uh, Francis asks, what's the uh, what's the pineapple room? Oh, um, it's um, <laughs> I saw you saw that on the plan. Yep. The pineapple room. Uh, it, it probably had um, I can't recall right off the top of my head if it's got some carving elements in it that are pineapple. Uh, it may very well be. Uh, and pineapple, as you know, uh, was in colonial times and still today in some air in, in some people's minds, a symbol of um, uh, welcome and graciousness for uh, guests to visit your home because pineapple was such an odd and um, uh, exotic thing to have. So uh, pineapple, I used to have old early American wallpaper that was pineapple motif in my guest room. I didn't put it there, but I, kind of got the hint. So I think the, I can't remember right off the top of my head, but I think there's some carved wooden carved features in that room that relate to pineapples. Uh, Marge asks, were copies of the wallpaper panels ever displayed at the Peabody Essex Museum? I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, they're just the sort of thing that would, would be there. They yeah. are, um, the ones that were in the China trade room, yeah, they were really quite remarkable pieces. And so uh, I have no doubt that if there's any part of it that has been displayed somewhere, that might have been a good spot for it. They show up in a lot of uh, wall studies of wallpaper from 18th century as well. So another Mary asks, uh, Mary, I have been to Beauport many times, yet today I learned so much more about it. Do you, do you, do you ever give tours there? Do you give tours there, Mary? I don't. Um, I, I should don't. hire you. <laughs> I, I work for the same company. Um, yes, we'll get to that in a second, yeah. Uh, um, I, I do not. Thank you. I, they have a Fabulous uh, staff there, and they know that place backwards and forwards. And I would, uh, the reason I've left this last slide up is that it is the website for Historic New England. It is how to get tickets to uh, find out more information about the Sleeper McCann House. So I wanted you to know when you Google Beauport, this will come up, but why in the world has it got several names? Now you know the answer to that. Uh, I will say that their season is ending soon. Uh, as you see, October 15th there. Um, and actually, it's ending a couple days earlier because of a conference. Uh, they offer a tour called the Nooks and Crannies Tour. By golly, I want to get on that one. Um, I'll, we'll learn even more. But thank you. I appreciate the compliment, but I do not. I do, however, give tours at the Winslow Crocker House out here on Cape Cod. Anonymous attendee asks, are any of the nearby mansions and cottages still there? Yes, thank you. They are. Um, but they've been um, they've been altered a lot. And uh, if I can go back, let's see. Uh, in this picture, you can see if you if you get the gist of it, if we look over to the left there and we see something that looks like a, a dock or a causeway or water sticking out into the water, there's a stone building that's butt up against pardon my French, uh, Beauport. And, and so that was something that has been built quite recently. Uh, the old ones exist more or less, but they've been, they've been changed often. And so it's not, it's not possible to, uh, I don't think wrong roof next door is there at all. I think it's something, a mansion of a newer age. 
Okay, Frances asks, in the China trade room, there was an elaborate chandelier. Any idea where that came from? Um, it looks like, let's just go back. If this doesn't give us all, um, it looks Italian to me, um, but I couldn't say for sure. All right, Kathy, <laughs> uh, Kathy with a comment. Uh, Kathy says, this reminds me of Sir John Soames House Soames Museum House. and its individuality. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes, exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, he's That's in London and you're right. Yes, that is chock-a-block with stuff. Um, we we laugh about it in art history terms. It's called the horror of leaving an empty space, you know. <laughs> um, and uh, Henry certainly didn't want to leave very many empty spaces in his house either. But Sir John Soane's house is is a remarkable place to look at. Yeah. Uh, Mary asks, are the five servants' rooms ever open to the public? I think maybe on that nooks and crannies tour, perhaps. Uh, but I have not seen them myself. Teresa asks, who owned the house before Sleeper? Nobody. It didn't exist. There you go. Teresa tried to trick me with that question. I yeah, me too. That. Me too. Okay. She almost got um, us. Let me jump back to the uh, chat. Um, Eva Jane says, I loved my visit there many years ago. Uh, Sally says, wonderful talk. Thank you. Years ago, I snitched a seed pond while there of a small little plant called herb. Uh, Herb Robert. Uh, it is still popping up all over my garden and always <laughs> reminds me of Boatport. Oh, that's nice. Oh, sweet. That's cute. Yeah. Frank says, fascinating presentation. Thank you. Renee says, my understanding from visiting Beauport, uh, Beauport is that Henry Sleeper actually innovated and invented the profession of interior design. It did not exist prior to him. Is that right. correct? I think that that's um, what people think of today. Yes, I do. I believe it's accurate to refer to him as one of the first ever professional interior designers in this country. And uh, he was he was well known at the time that he was alive. As I said, he was he was uh, praised and honored by the American Architects uh, Architectural Institute of America at the time. You know, he was he worked for Historic New England. Um, and I think it was all in reference to his work as an interior designer. Uh, and that, yes, I think it's fair to say that he would be considered um, one of, if not the first professional one in America. Yep. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, even though he's not well known now, perhaps, yeah, in his lifetime, he was very well known. He just didn't create a lot of high profile projects. A lot of the work that he did was uh, for people, for friends and family and, you know, a small social, social circle. Um, his biggest, as I say, influence was the work he did uh, at Winterthur for DuPont. But um, um our answers to everything and having a full view of everything the man created is is almost impossible for us to recreate due to the fact that his professional papers don't don't survive. Yeah, later in the chat, uh, Diane um, notes that uh, Elsie DeWolf, I guess, is considered yeah. by many to be the first interior designer, but right. uh, certainly Sleeper is one of the first. Um, yes. Karen uh, says, uh, thank you. I really enjoyed this and look forward to your presentations. Renee says, I can see where this needed to be a summer cottage, the way they could do all of the constant renovations in the wintertime when no one was there. Good point. Um, Very good Mary point. asks, did Sleeper ever get married? And uh, also, how did he acquire his money? Um, he never married. He was a lifelong bachelor. Um, these days, um, uh, Historic New England, who manages the home uh, and for the public, um, acknowledges Sleeper was um, living a life as, as a gay man in early 20th century United States, um, but we don't know about his personal life other than to know for sure he never married. Uh, he, he inherited his money. His family money came from real estate investments. His father, I mentioned, had been a Civil War major, but the money came from um, real estate investments. All right, I'm going to need rapid fire answers here. Uh, so Francis says, thank you. I enjoyed the tour. MC says that she's uh, toured the house before. Uh, Andrea, Andrea asks, uh, or Andrea, maybe I'm going to say Andrea asks, uh, what happened to the huge hotel? It burned down. Burned down. It yep. Burned, 
It burned down. It, it, right. it burned, uh, yes. And then Henry bought some of the land, not all of it, but he bought some of it and built, um, scooshed his house out that way. So that's where like the octagon, the red room, uh, room with the red toll where um, the Mariner's room, that side of the house um, is mm -hmm. what he took up land from the house. Okay, that wasn't rapid fire, sorry. That's so okay, no, you were doing well <laughs> and then we veered off. Uh, Teresa says, uh, okay, actually, let me skip that one. Mary says, thank you for a fascinating talk. I visited years ago and definitely want to go back. Uh, Barbara says, wonderful presentation. Thank you so much, Mary. Great job as usual. Teresa Thanks. says, excellent presentation. Thank you. Seeing the house in person is an amazing experience. Diane says, very informative. Thank you. Uh, Ruth, I skipped your final question. Uh, I wanted to circle back to Kathy's question. She says, are you planning any other talks, Mary, <laughs> on historic New England properties? Um, uh, so I'm not quite sure that's the case, but Mary, what do, what do you have cooking up? Okay, so uh, Robert's going to hold my feet to the fire here because uh, he's going to give me a deadline. Uh, I am, I am working... this. This is on video. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Uh, for 2023. Okay, here we go. Uh, I am working on one um, about Elizabethan England. Um, as, as we all know, with the death of Queen Elizabeth uh, II, we um, have just ended a uh, second Elizabethan age of English history. So we're going to have a look at the first Elizabeth uh, and the first Elizabethan age. It coincides with the fantastic exhibit which opens this week at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And I say coincide simply means I want to fire up your interest in the Tudors and Elizabeth uh, the first, and then you can take yourself to uh, New York City and see an exhibit there. I'm also working on one about uh, Notre Dame de Paris. Uh, so we'll look at the church. Uh, before um, when it first began being built and we'll look at what it will look like before the fire and we will look at what the current restoration projects are focusing on and the hopes of what they want to get finished by 2024 when the Olympics get there. So those are the first two that are out of the shoot for 2023. And so, Kathy, you may not be aware of this, um, or was it Karen? I'm sorry. No, Kathy, uh, you may not be aware of this, but we actually partner with Historic New England. So independent of Mary, we partner with Historic New England uh, once a month for um, virtual programs. We've been doing it for maybe nine months now. And um, so the, the upcoming ones aren't actually talking about properties per se, but uh, on Monday, October 24th at 11 o'clock, um, we're going to have, and you may know some of these folks, Mary, uh, Erica Loam, who's the Associate Curator at Historic New England. Uh, mm -hmm. She'll be talking about Jewish immigrants in the American antiques trade. Uh, and then on Monday, November 21st at 11 o'clock, we're hosting Ken Torino, who's the Manager of Community Partnerships and Resource Development at Historic New England, uh, for Boston's Haymarket and the Market District. So the history of Haymarket and the Boston Market District. So uh, that's what's coming up in that series. And then circling back to Mary, I have bad news and good news. Mary will not be with us for, uh, well, first of all, Mary, we actually have two programs with you coming up, if I'm not mistaken, or do I have that wrong? I think we actually have something with you later this month on the 27th, but let me... Uh, let me do this in real time. I could be totally wrong. Let me, I do. We do a lot of art history programs. So let me scroll down to the 27th. Yeah, yeah, I'm right. So um, we have a uh, digging deeper. Um, uh, ho hopefully, hopefully we're on the same page, Mary. So on Thursday, October 27th, 11 o'clock, uh, digging deeper. How am I pronouncing this? S sudden ho? Sudden who? Sudden who? Sudden Who and Anglo-Saxon England. That's going to be uh, Thursday, October 27th, 11 o'clock. And then the one I'm looking forward to. So, so the bad news is we, we have no Mary in November. November. But then we have Mary right at the beginning of December, Thursday, December 1st, the history of Nutcrackers, which I'm looking yes. forward to. Yes. Um, so right. It, Right. Yes. How could I forget the Anglo-Saxons? Right. How so could you possibly we, forget? So, I so don't, the good I news don't. is... We have Mary. We have Mary once more this month, and then we have her at the beginning of December, but nothing in November. It gets a little confusing around the holidays. I mix up the Here schedule. Uh, right. But anyway, all that information will be in the email I send out either later today or tomorrow morning. Um, Mary, do you have any last words for the group uh, before we wrap I it up? Do. Thank you all for joining me, um, and uh, thank you, Robert, again for the opportunity to to share this information. Appreciate it. Thank you.
All right. Thank you so much, Mary. I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. And I hope yep. to see many of you um, at some other upcoming virtual art history programs. Thanks again. Bye-bye. All righty. Bye-bye.